This talk is called Artseeker, um, and it's about using headless Drupal to power an AI art recognition tool that we run. So before I start an acknowledgement of country, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we meet today on the unceded lands of the Gadigal of the Eora. I pay respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders past and present and extend that acknowledgement to all First Nations people here today. In the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge the immense creative contribution First Australians made to the art and culture of this country. Me. That's me. So you can trust that this is the right speaker. I'm the Digital Transformation Manager over at the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art. I live on Bunjalung land right now, and that is me against the Art Gallery. And here is a picture of our art gallery. This is on Kirilpa Point on the banks of Mewa. And we can kind of see this body. There's this beautiful artwork on the, on, on the side of that, which is called Nightlife by Terrell, which lights up on an 80-minute slow-looking experience. And I bring up physical place because it is so important to this technology digital project that I'm talking about today. And I want to talk about our institution. Again, this solution is grounded in the requirements of my organization. Our vision at Quagoma, and I'll use Quagoma, Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art, only 1G, we aim to be Australia's most inspiring and welcoming gallery, a global leader in contemporary art of Asia, Australia and Pacific. I bring that up. We are a contemporary art gallery. We are not an art gallery of Queensland. We are a gallery of Australia, Asia, Pacific. It is the confluence of those kind of geographic regions. And the purpose of what we're trying to do is connect people with the power of art and creativity. Again. This vision and purpose is what's driving this technology and the fact that there's a physical place where we want to experience this digital experience. So me, I run a program called the Digital Transformation Project. Ultimately, there's two kind of major components to it, one of which is to digitize our collection. When you go to an art gallery, only about five, at most 10% of the collection is on display, 90 to 95% is behind the scenes. So what we want to do is photograph, those artworks work with the artist to, to take the best kind of portrayal of the work and that um, conveys their artistic meaning and make that available through digital channels. Now, we also want to improve our back of house processes so that it's easier for people to connect with the digital stories that represent this art. So this is my system architecture. It's a lot of specialist applications connecting together. We're not going to dwell on this, but what I will point out is that, and this goes from our point of sale software to our event ticketing to all kinds of things. But what's important is that where, and I'll talk about the technical architecture later, there's no code in this. This is just about a Drupal solution. Our Drupal solution sits here above where a lot of our content is captured. We capture content and put it in our digital asset management system. We study our art and we put it in the collection management system, which confusingly uses the acronym CMS, collection management system. But that all comes together in this Drupal site. And because of this kind of decoupled architecture, it's going to enable what I'm about to share. So we had a bit of a problem space, which was how do we make it easier to access the art and digital content when you're on site? How do we remove barriers between uh, what the work and the content? And how do we make art more accessible? In the past, we've, uh, lots of art museums have looked at solutions like putting QR codes next to works or little specialist apps where you punch a number in and you get some content back. But they're not very welcoming things. Like if you're intimidated by the art and you don't understand it, like getting up really close and scanning a code and then visiting a website that it, you've really had to have engaged kind of one of the more passive experience. And then there have been things like in the museum space like beacons which generate, which push content to you. But I kind of wanted you to engage a little bit. So that's where we came up with this. So. We're going to start with a little demo because that's going to probably illustrate the point a bit better. So now let's do a little bit of a demonstration of Artseeker in action. So I've got the uh, web app up. I activate the camera. We'll get the work inside the crosshairs. Take a quick photo and it pretty instantly recognizes it. Yes, this is the work. We'll then come back and start returning some information. We can get a bit of a description about it. The color profile is really cool because what happens is it simplifies the artwork to find the five most dominant colors within that. And then it searches the rest of the collection, takes a couple of seconds to find any other works that have that balance. So it's not looking for 
a single colour, it's looking for a balance of colours. We ask, how does this make you feel? You can leave a bit of a discussion so we can thread for some resources. In any materials that we have about that particular work, we can just browse them here. And then also we can kind of show what's nearby. So if you don't want to go through the effort of scanning, again, because you, know, you don't want to wait, wait those 200 milliseconds, you can kind of browse through everything else that's in the room and potentially look at those works and also find some content about those. So that's what we ended up developing. So I'm going to go through a bit of a timeline as to how we got there. Back in December 2021, we um, took on an internship from uh, QUT. We had a person who was working on autonomous cars. Um, and I wanted to look at the role of AI to help remove cultural bias out of image classification. The reason I do that, back in 2021, if you threw any kind of Asian, Pacific, Indigenous art at these AI image classifiers, they had no idea what was going on. So if you talk back to our mission, contemporary art, Asia, Pacific, Australia, these things are built on out of copyright Western art, useless. So that's why we wanted to look at how we could do that. So here's a few of the experiments we ran. First of all, we tried to just train some models where we kind of you know, did that kind of machine learning thing where you tag up lots of different works and it can identify things. Okay, but because there's so, there's so many different um, artistic styles, so many different nations, it really wasn't good for indigenous art. Then we looked at um, Asian art. So here's some Japanese prints. And then you'll have on the left, there's a heat map of what it identified an untrained image of what was the points of focus inside that artwork. And on the right was it identifying correctly more things of interest that you could search and find objects within the art. Only issue is the only way we were able to validate that was because there were a lot of US museums that have digitized their collections of Japanese prints and were able to throw lots of information at it to validate the model. And that only really works because there was a lot of I guess similarities because they're prints and often we had the same prints that they did. So maybe not so good. Then we tried, and you saw a bit of that in the demo, what about rather than just exploring by one or two colours, we could look at a different way of exploring art through balances of colours. One of the issues that if you're not an art historian, like me, I'm not, um, it's very difficult to look at a work and go, I know why I like that because of this kind of idea. So we thought, well, what about something's visually appealing to you if we can look at the balance of why that's visually appealing, maybe you could search by aesthetics. And that was quite promising. And then right towards the end of the project, we found this, which was if we built a model of what art looked like from different angles and then threw some really bad photos at it, it was very good at identifying them. And that actually became the genesis of where we headed next. So that was just um, pretty much an internship project with a PhD student. So then when that finished in July 2022, we gave ourselves a deadline of April 2023 to build a progressive web app on a shoestring. So we wanted to narrow down to the right algorithm because, you know, uh, recognizing the work is using an AI model, how to train that process, how to scale it, the UX design, the kind of technical architecture, and what actually makes it engaging. Why we are aiming for that date is on April 2023, we launched Creative Generation, which is where we invite the top year 12 students in Queensland to put in their artworks. And um, it's a younger audience and there's only 32 of them. So we could have like this one-to-one -one relationship, talk about them, ask them questions that they wanted to put. So when they scan the work, the artist could actually talk back to the public. And younger audience and on the showcase night went really well. It got scanned lots and a lot of people left comments. And here, excuse the quality, but this was from the opening weekend. So it gives you an idea from that concept of a few things, where, how we had it going on the, uh, on the opening night. So this is a quick demo of the Art Seeker app. So the idea is that we just point the camera at the work and then we can identify it. So I'm in the app. I'm going to line up the work as good as I can, find it, and it pretty much instantly finds the work. Then I can get the color information, the statement, I can leave a message for the artist that goes into moderation and kind of find out more about that. So that's good for a flat work. So let's try that out now on something a little bit more three dimensional. Instant. So there we've got. And once we've seen a work, we can then look back at the history. We can potentially favorite a work if we want. So I'll put that in my favorites. And that way I can kind of personally collect show as I go through. 
That was the idea too, that you could let, collect the works that you really loved and take it home with you rather than taking lots of photos of labels and so on so that you had this personalised experience for when you got home. Cool. So this, no, you already heard about you. Now, where we are now is we did a soft pilot for um, a, new, a new show called Small Figures. It was, I'll go in the lessons learned later, it wasn't the right show for it because these are these tiny things, there isn't much information. So you scan it, you get the novelty. One thing I learned in this process is when you get visitors using this app, they're blown away for 20 seconds. They're like, wow, it just instantly recognized it and then it's just standard. Like, yeah, I should be able to do this everywhere, right? Even though it's really hard. Anyway, um, so we've quietly launched this now and now it works everywhere in the gallery. So anywhere, apart from a ticketed show because of copyright reasons, every work and display in any of our buildings will work with this app. So now I'm going to go behind the scenes. What is it built with? Well, we are here at Drupal South, so it does, I'll speed it up a bit. Um, effectively, we have a collection management system and digital asset management system that feeds into a Drupal 10 site that's hosted on platform. Then there's an Expo progressive web app, which is a React Native opinionated framework. You use that to take a photo of an image of a, of a painting. It, uses, it hits AWS, uh, an API endpoint that hits an inference engine that finds the most likely match to your artwork, sends an ID back, you go to Drupal, get all that information, you have your result. So that, that's the guts of it. I'm now going to talk about each part. So Drupal 10, we have a traditional monolithic Drupal 10 site, which runs our collection online. You can go visit it if you want. I highly recommend it. It's very nice. I may have made it. Um, so it is the anchor and source of truth for the whole project. Every day when we make changes to our collection system, it goes into here. We have a digital asset management system. When there's new images, you, there's a webhook. You fire that, it populates the site. Additionally, content publishers use this site um, to make um, these things called digital stories, which weave together all of the different art pieces. And we've got a few hundred pages of these now. And that kind of creates a bit of context. And rather than just the raw works, we bring them in as well. But more recently, additional to that monolithic site, we also have an API available that provides all of that content. So on top of that, monolithic website, everything's available via an API, and that's what we use for the app itself. So it's gone from, and that is now delivering hundreds of thousands of API um, lookups, which affected our hosting, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, and most of them is through a content, um, is, is uh, through a, a custom module, that, that API we built. Now, why we use Drupal 10 is there's lots of apps out there that galleries use that you can buy off the shelf but they all involve you copying and pasting your information, putting it in that app, and maintaining it. And that is guaranteed to work for as long as you've got project funding. So what we needed to do is build something that was sat on top of everything else we're doing. So making every time a, a registrar adds new information into the CMS, the collection system, sorry, it updates ArtSeeker, it updates Collection Online. So Drupal is the middleware. It aggregates content from everyone else's existing workflows, and it doesn't add anything in order to enhance everyone's work, uh, enhance this um, visitor experience. Now we chose Expo as our opinionated kind of React Native framework. It's very cool. Um, uh, so there's two of us on the project. I work part time. I've got the rest of that stack you saw earlier. So, and I have. Um, we got Drew here from Gaia Resources. Shout out to Gaia. We have, I have one day a month with Gaia to do my code reviews. And then Nick, who you'll see very shortly in another video, makes the front end and does the AI work. Now, this is really good. I highly recommend getting, if you want to do some React Native stuff, Expo is really fun, getting into it. We had some issues with the camera library in old versions of Samsung Android that were nightmarish. But apart from that, it's been pretty seamless. So I'm going faster to make up time. I did have more to say, but next up is our faster AI inference engine. So this is where I get a little bit into the AI. Now, when I say AI, I'm talking about uh, deep learning networks. I'm not talking about large language models. Now, during the early stage of the project, we, we used a Siamese neural network. And the way to think of a Siamese neural network is it's a bit like a uh, fingerprint kind of thing. You have a big database of fingerprints, and then you find the closest look. Issue with that is it does double lookups. So the simplified, the bigger it gets, it gets exponentially slower. So it was fine when we did um, uh, Creative Gen where there were 32 artworks, but when we scale it to 1,000 artworks, the inference time was going, going up to 40 seconds. So, and in terms of building the, um, the uh, inference model that you look up against, 
uh, we, we were up to 72 GPU AWS machines in order to just build the model, and sometimes they were timing out. And big shout, if anyone's from AWS, thank you so much for giving us the credits for that. There was no way we could have afforded those machines. Um, so as, as it just got slower and slower, but it was really accurate, so it was very hard to let get, but we knew visitors weren't going to wait 40 minutes. And um, uh, 40 seconds, sorry. But here, Fast AI came along, um, which I think if you can read on the screen there, Fast AI, making neural nets uncool again. So when just picking up from Dries's note there about how it's foundation, going to Fast AI was a bit like that. It was kind of like very foundational, solid, fast, but it wasn't cool. It was based in Queensland, but it, it is great. It, was, it just blew our mind away how good this thing was. To give you an idea, it scales linear. So, and we were no longer, we were now just using regular machines to build the model. And it was taking an hour, it wasn't taking a day. It was taking dollars to build, to rebuild the um, inference model. It wasn't taking hundreds of dollars. And we found that to make a, a, an accurate kind of reference point, we only needed six images, not 60. Um, it got very, it got less confused by unusual sh shapes, which may not sound like much, but if you take, if there's a three dimensional work like a sculpture, if you photograph it from one side, there's a whole bunch of paintings on that side. If you photograph it from the other, a whole bunch of paintings on that. You need to be able to identify both. And why fast AI works really well is it takes into account the lighting and the kind of background colors. So we still have the Siamese um, neural network available to us and we can switch to it if we lack confidence in fast AI. The disadvantage is about 95% accurate. So it, it, if it doesn't know, it's, it's, it's like ChatGPT. It just make, it just goes, oh, this is good enough. So you, you can scan some works and it will give you the wrong result. And that's why we have this card method of showing you the most likely one and then you scan through them. But we figured 200 milliseconds versus 40 seconds, it's worth it. So, oh, make, I'm almost there. Um, there's tech stack. So the last part is our AWS work. So the front end is a um, Lambda function. Uh, we have a Dynamo database that holds a lot of the kind of inference training machine and uh, information. And we use SageMaker, which is an AWS service for building AI models. Um, every time we take more photos or we rehang a gallery. So one of the issues with Lambda though is it takes a little while to wake up. So the first visitor in the morning was taking 30 or 40 seconds to get something. So we now just have like a little service that pings it during business hours so it stays awake. Still a lot cheaper than running a server. And also I guess one really cool thing is although we still need SageMaker to build our models that we check up and get the artworks against, we can now host them on tiny little EC2 machines when we do the inference lookup. So we've now just got like some EC2 smalls that are powering the API endpoint that give us the information about the art back. Okay, so I went through really fast because I was making up time, but one thing I really wanted to bring up was this audit app that we developed. So one of the issues we had is that it was fine when there were 32 works for Creative Gen, but when 50 works go on display each week, going around with our phones, taking them all, and then putting them into our laptop and then dragging them into an S3 bucket and putting them in the right place and training them. It's taking all that time. So Nick, who you'll soon see, who did the expo work, built this little app here that allows us to much more quickly train our AI models. And I actually think it's impressive that you can point your camera at any artwork in our galleries and get all that info back. But I actually think what he built here is just as impressive. So I'm now going to show how, how we do, yeah. how we train it. So what AI. we did is we actually built some tools to assist us in that. And I'll give you a demo of that now. If I open up this internal app, I can do the training by, of this work by just finding it in the list. So I'll just do a quick search. Here it is. And then I can go down and add training data. So here, I'll first tick this flag to take a reference image. This is what we use to verify with the training data that it's the correct image. And then all I do is take five images. So one from the middle, and then I'll step around the artwork and just get on slightly different angles just to give it some coverage of the different angles that people might take of this artwork. And that's all we do to get the 200 millisecond response time for info. So, that, oops. so what? So yeah, that, that's, that was amazing because when we're doing 30, great. But right now, 
when we walk through the gallery each morning and there's been a rotation by the curators, we're like, great, take five photos. And then when we've had enough rotations, we rerun the model. So now we're on the other side of the pilot and we're in the soft life. What are some learnings in my last couple of minutes? What's going well? Small agile team. I was saying to Drew earlier, this is the most successful agile project I've ever worked on. Agile has become a little bit of a dirty word because it's like, you know, fixed budget, changing scope all the time. But we have, I have one day a week, uh, one day a month with Guy Resources to get my code done on the back end. And that's all we do. We do one day worth of work, really compound, and we release a new version of Collection Online on that day. The rest of the time, Nick is working on the site and building the front end. And because of that, it's, we just meet once a week for 30 minutes, pivot it, test it, and it's done. So the, the operational overhead is tiny versus the build time. Making it work within our, our workflows, that's so important. The reason so many of these style of projects fall over is because they're additional to everyone's BAU. This takes BAU and adds a visitor experience on top of it. Look, how well the tech works. We didn't write the fast AI library, but we get dumbfounded how well it works. Like, sometimes we're like going outside and it's like raining and we're taking a photo of a sculpture and the light's completely different and, or it's night and it just works. And we're like, you should not work off five photos. But it is just amazing how well that thing works. Um, we've kept everything really agnostic. I talked earlier about the API calls. Um, because we started going headless, the Pantheon bill, because that counts each API call as a visit, was gone through the roof. So we re platform to platform pretty quickly. That, so being really mindful of not embedding too much with, uh, in any particular kind of area was being really good. And doing the kids, sorry, I mean the young adults, was a really good pilot phase because we had this really kind of interactive audience that wanted to use it, that wanted to leave voice memos, that actually gave us feedback and said, hey, my old Android doesn't work. So that was good. What wasn't is that we started with cool tech, but we forgot that there needed to be an engagement hook. So we've always been catching up that the tech is actually better than the content we're delivering. Content is king. Like there has to be a good thing that you get when you scan that. So yes, it's great that we leverage our work, but we really need to pivot the way that we create work so that it's a bit better. So um, ongoing funding, I Nick is on contract and uh, yeah, we're running out of funding. And innovation in a traditional org can be really hard. We are an art gallery. Our sole KPI is visitation. So yes, we're using digital to augment that sole KPI, but it's also a very traditional org. And this is a very different way of thinking about art. It's not thinking about the main outcome being an exhibition brochure, I mean, publication at the end that you buy. This is about continually delivering content. It's a very different mind shift. Now, I have one more video, but I'm not going to play it because... I'm, I'm, I'm making up time, but I think, okay, so now we're at the end of this talk. I hope you enjoyed it. We're going to demonstrate a few kind of more. I'll just kind skip. Of similar. I'll skip so forward just up, because I actually started it. Let's have a look at this one it. here. So it gives you an idea that the 3D works uh, going Straight to away. as well. And that is a very asymmetrical sculpture, that one. And I will go forward to Next this up, part. I'm looking at some historic photos here. Now, I wanted to demonstrate on these in particular because they've got similar frames, they've got similar color schemes, and of a similar time. And I wanted to show how well it can kind of work. So let's have a look at this one. So we get the idea. Um, Sorry, I had to race through that. There's a lot of work that went down. Um, I don't think we got, have we got any time for questions? I did want to try and get a couple in if we did. One or two. Is there any, any questions from the audience? Yeah, that's a really good question. And this is actually a wider gallery question altogether. One of the few positives that came out of visitor experience in QR codes is in Queensland, everyone had to check in to go in. So we kind of went to all this effort of training people how to use QR codes and then immediately said, don't use them. Um, the, the main way that we're currently doing it right now is through the floor office. A lot of people have questions about the artwork. So you, you, you talk to someone who's working there. Um, we're, we're training them to show how they can use the app and give them the kind of materials to onboard them on. How do I, we're introducing wayfinding as well. How do I get between rooms? So our main way in is actually through physical people. Last one. Um, so 
when um when the, when the users are taking the photos, is that also feeding back into the the learning as well, like in terms of the accuracy of the? Another great question. We we take all of the false. Uh, we take the monitor of when people don't correctly identify. So at the start it says, is this the work? And if they say yes, that means we get reinforcement learning that that particular set of training data is working well. And if they say no, it flags to us that we probably need to retrain that work. Have you noticed like an increase in terms of the accuracy? So, like, have you noticed an increase in terms of the accuracy of, of, of the learning models there? Like, can, can you track... I think you said it was like it's 95 yeah. percent accurate like is there uh... to, to be honest the the usage because it's soft launched hasn't been high enough the areas where we've hard launched it have been like you know, the galleries that where the works are so different that they're um not, yeah that they're quite noticeable we hope it does and we have definitely we take we take the error reports here.